Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's Nile webinar. This is Brianne Van Dyne, the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, and I will be today's moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. If we should get disconnected for any reason, please call right back and we will continue. First, please locate the uh, chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you have any questions, type them in the chat box, and we will address those questions at the end of the presentation. Second, if you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post-webinar email. The email will be sent out by the end of today, and all CEUs will be mailed out within the next week. A little disclaimer. Immunize Nevada's Nile webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization-related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. I'd like to now turn it over to our speaker, Dr. Randall Christensen, who is the founder and owner of Randall Christensen Consulting. Dr. Randall Christensen earned both his MD and his MPH degrees from Tufts University School of Medicine in 1995. After his residency in Phoenix, Arizona, Dr. Christensen began working at Phoenix Children's Hospital as the medical director of the Cruz and Healthmobile and ultimately served as the president of the medical staff. In 2016, he left Arizona to become the chief medical officer for the largest federally qualified health center in Nevada. There, he was able to provide his leadership skills to grow the organization, both in size and breadth, including building family practice residency continuity clinics and mobile medical units to treat homeless patients and victims of sex trafficking. Currently, at Randall Christensen Consulting, Dr. Christensen advises organizations on how to create and build community programs that are sustainable, innovative, and impactful. Dr. Christensen, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for the invitation, and um, thank you all for uh, logging on to uh, have a great discussion. I uh, am going to jump right into it. Uh, there we go. So um, the big blue mobile unit that you see in front of you is, um, is still currently serving uh, children in the state of Arizona. You're going to see a number of these mobile units throughout my lecture. Uh, instead of having a office um, like many pediatricians do, my office really was uh, a, a big blue mobile unit, and uh, we spent uh, the vast majority of our time taking care of kids literally out in the streets. It's uh, pretty easy for me to say that this was my passion. It still is my passion. Um, that's why I've made some recent decisions to go and and help other organizations um, build such wonderful programs as, as this one that, that I left behind in the hands of really great, uh, really great folks. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. So very quickly, um, I think that this next slide really gives the essence of what I'm trying to do today. Um, I, literally want to take you for a, law, a ride along with my old team and my new team that I had at Nevada Health Centers um, that essentially made a lot of mistakes. I'm a firm believer in understanding those mistakes, looking at those mistakes, allowing people to make those mistakes in order to learn, in order to kind of move forward. Um, I take a lot of responsibility for all the mistakes that were made, but in the end, um, I think it really helped us connect to the community in uh, Arizona and certainly uh, has helped us connect to the communities here in Nevada as well. We're clearly going to talk a little bit about the strategies that um, that we came up with, and again, these strategies are due to the mistakes that we made and just sort of the on-the-job training that I had. If you're going to remember anything from this discussion, I think um, the next several statements are probably the, the key um, takeaway points. 
the first thing is uh, an idea of uh, connecting your priorities um, to really what what the people that you're helping want, what they need. In order to get those priorities, you really do have to start to listen. Um, I felt this was so important that I created that as a tagline in, in my consulting business. You really need to listen. And, um, and that's sometimes hard, certainly in this, in this day and age when we want to get right to the point and get right to uh, uh, sort of solving the problem. If you can involve and engage the community early, that's your best bet. Um, when they firmly have a buy-in, that's when you start to see success. In the end, when you're connecting with communities, what you really want is those folks that are, are there um, in the community, um, they should be the ones to run it. They should be able to run the programs or at least be part of the leadership in that. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we, as we move uh, forward. And um, hopefully with all of these uh, key concepts, um, the ownership and the buy-in will lead to, to great success. So right now you're sitting there thinking and you're saying, well, I got a lot of questions. And some of those questions that you might be asking is, you know, Am, am I the expert? Am I one to, to be able to give you this information and really can that information lead to the success that you are desiring to connect with the community? I can tell you that my expertise in these matters comes again from making those mistakes, from doing things that I wish I had done differently and um, it was no uh, easy journey, but I think I'm much better prepared uh, now. The next question is, will it be easy? And the truth is that no, it's not, because you have to listen and spend time in the community and get buy-in. That takes a lot of extra steps rather than just creating a program and getting funding for it and putting that program out on the streets. The next question is, will it ever end? And the truth is no. And, and most of the great organizations that I've been a part of, they have um, never-ending committees or advisory panels or focus groups or something that continues to look at the mission and look at the direction of the organization and help it move as it continues to evolve over time. And then the end is, will it be worth it? And uh, my experience is that once you do connect to the communities, you learn so much, and the programs that you thought would be needed to help out in the communities um, become ever stronger and more than um, you could have ever done alone. So let's start way back at the beginning. Um, my story and the story uh, of the homeless um, outreach medical vans in Arizona started a long time ago. There were a number of nonprofits out on the streets in Arizona taking care of homeless children and homeless teens. One of the ones that you see sort of in front of you was a group called Home Base Youth Services. This was a nonprofit organization that really spent um, a lot of time out on the streets. They provided food, um, they provided some uh, transportation, they provided some counseling, um, and uh, ultimately they provided um, some shelter. One of the things that they noticed is that um, there was a lot of medical care that was not being provided. And so they look um, looked around the community to see what, uh, what they could do. Um, ultimately, they, they did something really unique. They got a lot of, of uh, the city um, administration teams and even the mayors of the city of Phoenix and a couple of other um, uh, cities close by to Phoenix 
to spend a night on the streets, literally to be homeless for a night. This um, caused a, a great story to be printed in uh, one of the papers and on the television there in Arizona, just about the plight of these kids. It was shortly after that that Phoenix Children's um, became very interested in um, this organization, and lo and behold, the two organizations got together and they said, hey, let's write a, um, a grant. And um, another organization said, hey, well, we have a, a medical mobile unit that we're not using anymore. Um, we'd love to donate it to you. So the slide that you're looking at um, did uh, indeed have some humble beginnings. This mobile unit was sold to Phoenix Children's um, for $1, and I can promise you that we paid way too much for that mobile unit. Uh, it um, was an older unit. It had lots and lots of mechanical issues. Things broke down almost constantly, sometimes two or three. But the truth of it was I was out on the streets um, in late 1999, early 2000, in this mobile unit, and I was ex as excited as I could be. I was uh, just out of my residency. I thought I knew um, a whole lot of, of information and really did have a, a desire to change the world and a desire to end homelessness, um, at least on the streets in, in Phoenix. Um, that blue uh, color came on shortly thereafter in uh, 2000. This was a, a picture of the mobile unit um, out at uh, Arizona State University. So a lot of the homeless teenagers um, lived out behind where ASU is. And this was uh, one of our sites. As you can see, this is the blue mobile unit um, sitting there on a hot summer night. There was lawn chairs um, outside with the awning up. And this is when we began to um, see a lot of patients. They started to walk in. Again, I was really new to the whole concept and um, as excited as I was to see them, every day seemed like a challenge. Um, I can even remember the first day when we showed up, uh, we had, we had um, a bunch of uh, paperwork that patients would need to fill out in order to get medical care on the blue mobile unit, and we had no clipboards. So you can imagine sitting there on one of those blue chairs, um, hoping that you could uh, fill out your paperwork with a pen um, on, I don't know, the, the asphalt there, or one of the arms of the chairs. Uh, needless to say, we were not as prepared as we had hoped. But things continued, and we continued to move forward. Um, that same uh, newspaper um, continued to follow us and uh, ultimately uh, printed up a number of other stories. The next slide shows a nurse practitioner that worked for us, and um, we began to get a name around town as somebody who could help. Um, there was, again, lots and lots of, of things to learn. Um, this was one of the interesting aspects of, uh, of my journey. So this article came out. It was uh, exciting to see us making the front page. It was uh, Care for Homeless Kids. It brought in a incredible amount of recognition, actually national recognition. It was after this story that NBC News um, ultimately did a um, story on us as well, and so we uh, hit national news uh, afterwards. But there's always sort of give and take, and there's pluses and minuses, and this was a, a constant reminder. So the girl that you see in that uh, picture, she was part of a um, clan uh, out on the street, and that clan um, disapproved of her telling the story um, to the newspapers. I don't know why. I don't 
know if they were just mad that they weren't asked to do it or if she um, was told not to do it in advance. Um, she didn't really spill any deep, dark secrets. She just talked about what it meant to be homeless. Um, but whatever the case was, she was severely beaten by the Klan um, shortly after this article hit the, hit the newsstand and ultimately ended up in the hospital with uh, severe injuries. It's one of those things that I never, I never anticipated something like that could happen or would happen. But um, it, it again is part of my my uh, story that um, makes me think about all of the ramifications that could happen and might happen as we um, try to uh, do stuff out in the community. They certainly take very serious the, the patients of mine that talk to the newspapers. I, I try to guide them and um, hopefully help them understand um, what it means for everyone else to hear the stories, but also I, I take it as a, as a personal um, goal to always um, speak for and uh, advocate for my, my patients and, and, again, really think about um, what happens um, to them when, when they're not in my care. So we continued to move forward. Um, we continued to um, understand a little bit more. Um, by one and two years uh, into this program, I uh, had become clearly uh, much better informed than uh, I was before in terms of the issues that were out there. I literally went out there to save these homeless kids. I went out there um, with the concept that if I provided good quality medical care, that that would somehow alleviate um, their burden and they could then move on forward to, you know, getting a job, getting a house, getting a car, getting in a good relationship. Um, going to college and, and essentially living uh, happily ever after. But the truth of it was is that healthcare was just a small piece, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, really what hit us um, hard was the realization that this entry into our system was clearly a tip of the iceberg. And this slide is my tip of the iceberg um, sort of explanation, or at least the best way that I can help um, others understand. These kids came to see us because they were hungry, they needed some clothing, maybe they needed some shelter, they certainly wanted their simple medical care, um, and they wanted to, you know, get their IDs to be able to get on uh, Medicaid in the state of Arizona. Um, and perhaps they just wanted to wash their clothes, um, so they came to us and, and Home Base Youth home Services and the other organizations that we partnered with. What we really began to understand was it was something much deeper. Um, some of them had unbelievably severe dental um, um, cavities and issues. Uh, they carried chronic medical conditions, chronic back pain in a 19-year-old because of constant uh, beatings or um, sleeping on rocks and such. They had foot problems that, that certainly matched the trench foot that um, was described in World War I. Um, they had a, a very much a, a lack of education and that missed many, many, many years worth of school. Um, they were jobless. They didn't have any adequate social skills. They didn't know how to walk up to somebody and shake their hand and ask for a job. Um, they had severe mental illness. Um, they were being forced into prostitution. Um, human trafficking, there was violence at every turn, and certainly rape um, was uh, almost commonplace. 
So these were the issues that were underneath um, that those layers as we began to um, peel back and, and understand really what we were doing and what we were up against. Um, they had many barriers to healthcare. Um, sometimes their language um, was not English and everything in Arizona was, was in English and, and maybe we could get a, a portion of it in Spanish. Um, they faced uh, legal issues throughout the state. Um, the trafficking um, or other gangs or clans, as we discussed earlier, um, led to a lot of fear and exploitation. Transportation was, um, was uh, all incredibly challenging. So um, very similar to Nevada, very, very uh, widespread um, um, geography um, and unfortunately uh, bus systems that, you know, couldn't traverse the, the, the geography well or it would take many, many buses to get from one point to another. Um, we talked a little bit about education. Um, clearly their finances were at minimum, um, mostly from uh, uh, begging and or stealing and or, you know, the odd jobs that really didn't pay very much. Um, there wasn't hardly any basic housing uh, opportunities. Um, and if you had any uh, issues, if you were pregnant, there was no housing for you. If you had warrants out for you, there was no housing. If you were under 18, a minor, and unaccompanied, there was no housing. Um, but just unbelievable uh, barriers to health care. Um, even though we were trying to meet them on the streets, there was still so many other things that we couldn't control for. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the mental health problem was um, just overwhelming. Um, we did some quick studies, and this is a, a result of some of the um, quick um, surveys that we began to take. Uh, when you started to talk about something like substance abuse, it wasn't, you know, a small portion. It was essentially everyone. So if we asked alcohol and or marijuana, it was virtually 100%. Um, you start talking about, you know, just other substances other than those two, and you're talking about 80% of, the, of them um, in the last six months had had some um, um, connection with some substances other than marijuana and alcohol. 62% um, had a history of family drug use. 66% were depressed in the last uh, and received a diagnosis of depression in the last six months. 20% um, had been on a medication or had been prescribed a medication for depression in the last six months. 44% had attempted suicide in the last six months. And 16%, and that just blows my mind that, you know, you basically got uh, greater than a 1 in 10 chance of, 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 of having suicidal thoughts. And 10% had homicidal or hurtful ideation often directed towards people that had wronged them. Um, these last two um, really still, even to this day, astound me that about 8% were hearing voices and 12% um, were having visual hallucinations. Those tend to be uh, uh, akin to some of the organic issues, so it may have been related to the drug use or it uh, could have been used to, uh, due to the fact that there were so many um, 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 people with psychosis um, and true schizophrenia um, out on the streets. So we were <laughs> really at a, at, a, at a turning point. We had been providing um, medical care. And, you know, as somebody who's coming from a children's hospital where I had, you know, uh, lots of consultants' help and, and evidence-based medicine. I knew we were providing good medical care, and we had enough funding to be able to provide the medications that uh, these uh, these folks needed. But we really were not getting anywhere. As a matter of fact, um, some of the people that I began to see on that very first year in 2000 were still homeless at. Um, in 2003, and I, and even 2004, and I began to um, 
wonder what what good were we doing? Why were we out there? Why were we um, um, even serving anybody if if nobody was was getting better um, with the with the medical care that we were provided? Right along this time, um, an interesting thing happened in the United States, um, and that was Hurricane Katrina um, devastated the, the coastal uh, region, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, um, and um, I was asked to take a, a mobile unit similar to the ones you saw down um, to Louisiana, Mississippi and set up programs. Um, I jumped to the chance thinking that I had been providing medical care, and then I was going to go and provide medical care to people um, who were um, devastated after the hurricane. Um, I got down there, and um, <laughs> lo and behold, um, all of the people that needed medical care were not that different from those folks that I was treating on the streets in Arizona. They had um, very little access to medical care. There was very few uh, pediatricians. Um, they had um, lots and lots of trouble, and it seemed like um, it was the same story. So it was that, um, that experience in which I began to realize that it didn't really make a difference if you were providing care in the hollers of West Virginia. It didn't make a difference if you were providing care in uh, the streets of San Francisco, the streets of Las Vegas, the streets of uh, Arizona. You needed to have a much better plan than uh, simple medical care. And that's when we began to really change our model of what we were trying to, to, to accomplish out on the street. And I'll start first by talking a little bit about what is commonly referred to as a medical home. Today, we often uh, refer to that as a patient-centered medical home, and it has a, a number of definitions. Uh, but the key points are that it's accessible to people, it's continuous, it's very comprehensive, it's family-centered, patient-centered, it's coordinated, it's compassionate, and it's culturally uh, sensitive. Um, these things make up sort of the foundation for that medical home. Um, what I have suggested um, all along is that you need to um, combine this with um, other thoughts around that. And really, this thought um, stems from the point that health is not the physician. Health is not um, a medication or a prescription of, uh, of medication. Health is not the vaccines that um, we, we give. Health is a part of that, but health is a much, much bigger um, concept. And that's really when you start talking about health in a very broad term, and you're really talking about well-being and wellness and um, happiness and, and truly, you know, living life to the, to the fullest. And this is when you begin to think about holistic approaches. You start talking about thoughtful interviewing. Uh, perhaps um, some of you have been trained in uh, trauma-informed interviewing techniques, um, and um, it really has to do with mental health and dental health and mentorship and life skills and job placement and shelter and legal um, safety and referrals and all this. So it is a large um, concept, and that's one that I continue to, to, to talk about to really try to get people to understand that picture in the uh, upper right hand of the, of the wheel is exactly how I think about health now. Every spoke is a different item, and medical care is there, and we need to be able to do the best evidence-based care that we can, but the other spokes include that mental health or that dental health or the mentorship or safety or shelter or safe neighborhoods or adequate areas to walk and exercise or 
um, all of those other issues that really connect us to true um, health. So once we had that concept, once we began to think about that, things just started to come much, much faster. And we began to look at um, ways in which we could connect to the community. Again, we began to listen to them, and, and they began to tell us um, um, what they needed and what, um, what we could do to help them. I'll give you a couple of examples. So clearly, I think that the mobile unit is an innovative approach. Mobile units are very expensive, probably three times as expensive as a fixed site care. Um, they break down, they uh, need gas, they um, are small uh, footprints. Um, so they're not the end all be all for you know, healthcare in America, but they make a lot of sense for a lot of specific hard to get to population, like homeless kids or maybe migrant farm workers or perhaps rural Nevada, um, those are the times in which you can use some of these. Um, the other two pictures to the right, those are um, school-based clinics. And so having um, clinics um, at schools in which you could do some behavioral health, you could do some asthma care, you could do some uh, vision screening and hearing screening, those are the wonderful things that you can do without causing a lot of um, pain and suffering for the parents. So you're able to get a lot of care done while they are uh, a captive audience. And guess what? They miss less school. They, um, <laughs> their parents don't have to take time off from, from jobs, all of these kind of things. So again, not the end all be all, but to some populations and some schools, it makes a lot of sense. In that lower right-hand corner, that is uh, a set of locked cabinets. And that's an example of just thinking about a problem. So we had a clinic at a family shelter, the largest family shelter in the state of Arizona. And we saw these patients from, you know, essentially 8.30 to 5.30 Monday through Friday, and we would see them. And many of them um, were living at that shelter. And so they'd come in and they'd talk to us. and um, They'd get um, care, and we'd say, hey, your, um, your daughter has an ear infection. Um, do you have insurance? Um, and they'd say, yes, we are on the Medicaid plan. In Arizona, it was called Access with a bunch of different names, not that much different from Nevada. And we'd say, great, here's a prescription. And then we'd see the parents walk out, and um, a little bit later, maybe one or two days, that kid would be back in the office. And now, unfortunately, the, the tympanic membrane had ruptured because the infection had gotten worse. And now there was, you know, um, pus literally draining out of the ear. And we'd say, oh, my goodness, why didn't we, why didn't you get that prescription filled? Why, why didn't you um, um, help um, us? with the care plan that we had come up with. And the parents would tell us, well, yeah, you, you gave me a prescription, but I got three other kids. I'd have to call a cab. I don't have a car seat. I'd end up at Walmart on a nine o'clock at night waiting for a pharmacist to fill a prescription. And <laughs> it, was, it was almost uh, somebody slapped us in the face and we said, wow, we had no idea the amount of trouble it was just to get a simple, um, a simple uh, medication like amoxicillin. We um, ultimately said, well, maybe we'll just give you the medication. We started to look at that, and we started thinking about that, and we're starting to think, well, you know, this is a, a medication that is covered by the insurance plan. We should be utilizing that. And then that way, um, other people and other doctors could look and see if there's refills or if we need to give them refills for allergy medications, all of those things. Then. So we began to think about that, and we knew that we couldn't um, stay open 24 hours a day in order to get their prescriptions, but we ultimately decided that one of the things that we could do was create an agreement with a pharmacy that delivered. The pharmacy 
said they would deliver, but they certainly couldn't go into the big family shelter and go knock on all the doors to find the, the parents. So um, I had literally just come back from Disneyland, and um, these lockers are the same that you would see at Disneyland where you go in and you open up a, a locker, you put in your quarter or whatnot, and um, you can have that locker for the day. So we created lockers that had different keys, and each one had the same master key. So if we wrote a prescription to Sally, um, we would give mom um, a, a key to locker number one and tell her, come back later that evening when the pharmacy had dropped off the medication. And so when she came back, um, she could look in locker number one and see if the medication was there. You can see there's little tiny holes in that, um, in that locker system. Um, the pharmacist would open up locker number one, and he'd say, I have a prescription for amoxicillin for Sally, and he'd see a copy of the prescription in locker number one, and so he'd put the amoxicillin in one. And maybe Tommy had locker number five, and somebody else had locker number eight, and you could only open up one locker at a time and uh, once you put your key in, it was no longer there. So you took your medicine and you left. Again, that was just a simple example of us beginning to listen, beginning to understand all of the issues that um, were, were affecting um, the care. I talked with you earlier about the barriers to health care. This was one of those that had a solution, but you needed to be able to understand um, all of the um, barriers to health care that that family was facing. So we began to understand that dental services were very challenging. So we began creating relationships with other organizations that provided mobile health um, clinics that came to shelters like where or came to the schools. And, and they allowed, again, that health care to take place. Just the same as a, as a child is not going to be able to learn in school um, with bad asthma or bad allergies. Um, if they have an impacted tooth that keeps getting infected, there is nothing that the medical provider is going to be able to help and the parents can't help, but the dental services can. And so we begin to, again, broaden our definition of what health meant. Um, this was uh, the next slide is vision services. So we also began to understand if we were going to help people get glasses, we needed to do um, some great screening. And so this, this concept of doing vision screening uh, began to change. So I'm sure you're all familiar with what's called the Snellen chart. That's a chart at the end of the hallway that you read off letters. Um, unfortunately, that technology <laughs> Um, was uh, developed in 1860s. Um, and so we began to look at high technology. This was um, uh, a while ago, and now there's, there's some unbelievable technologies, literally iPhone technologies that can uh, help. This is actually my little boy here. He was four years old, and he was playing a video game, and that video game actually um, was checking his vision. He was a little knight running around, jumping over alligators and stuff, and he had to choose doors to enter based upon uh, what he could see. He's also wearing red and blue, uh, like, sunglasses. This is also checking his uh, visual acuity, uh, not only checks his visual acuity, but uh, color blindness as well. And uh, you can see as a four-year-old, he was certainly able to be able to, to move around and check that. We have some great, great technology now that is allowing us to um, visually screen literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands um, there's mandated um, screening, visual screening in Canada. So all children do um, get screening um, utilizing some of this technology as well. And uh, I've been a part of a group here in the U.S. to expand that as well. And some of our systems, we have screened well over a million uh, children. Um, as I said, connecting to the community became very, very important. So. 
we felt that by telling our story and by connecting and understanding what uh, needs were for our patients, we could begin to connect other organizations. So the top left is, uh, is one of the Boy Scouts earning his Eagle Scout uh, Award, helping us connect up. Um, there's a number of donations that were ultimately dropped off, um, FedEx Cares, um, Red Nose Day, the Red Nose where you go to Walgreens and you pay for the Red Nose, um, was actually the funder that funded uh, $500,000 the state of Nevada for the mobile unit that uh, recently arrived, and I'll show you a picture of that um, um, in just a couple minutes. Um, ultimately, we began to think that it was important for other folks in the educational arena to understand. So we began training medical residents and medical students, nursing students, allied health students, high school students, retired volunteers, all of these folks came in and began to understand a little bit more of what it meant to be homeless uh, child or teenager on, on the streets. Um, we began to um, discuss all of these issues, particularly the health in, uh, in, a, in a, a broader base um, and uh, the patient-centered medical home. This is actually a picture of me um, on Capitol Hill, and, uh, and it's, it's a dear picture to me. Um, the person that we're talking to at this point is Congressman Ed Pastor. Um, he was a congressman from the state of Arizona for nearly 30 years. He passed away just uh, recently, um, just a, a couple of weeks ago, but I remain friends with him for those 20 years. Um, because uh, he was a strong supporter of, of building this, this complex um, health um, vision. And uh, I will uh, always consider him uh, just a wonderful uh, mentor for, for me and for my team. Um, the last sort of uh, picture of, of this discussion is um, this, um, this tale that I tell you um, with some of the hurt and some of the joy that I've experienced, um, I bring this book up not because um, I want to push copies, but because um, there really were some kids um, out in the streets that I want to honor with their story um, because they made it out from the streets. And then obviously there were a number of those kids who never made it out of the streets. And I want to continue to remember uh, them for all of my life. I'll end with um, a couple of the pictures here. This was the old, or my team that's actually still in, in practice in, in Arizona on the left, but that brand spanking new mobile unit on the right is the Las Vegas version. Um, this, uh, again, was brought um, by Walgreens and Red Nose Day, our connections to uh, national uh, networks like the Children's Health Fund. Um, currently, Nevada Health Centers is, uh, is bringing that out and meeting with some wonderful people. I think Catholic Charities, National Partnership for Homeless Youth, um, Three Square, um, just some really neat um, people out in the community all connecting up. Again, the vision for this mobile unit is to provide that medical care. But as I said before, there's so many other things that are needed. And um, Las Vegas is not the same as, 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 as um, Phoenix. And so the team that I trained in order to get this up and running are listening to the community now and having um, community connections in order to be able to help this evolve and really um, provide the best um, uh, um, the best care for for those patients. So I thank you all for for listening to to my story, and I'd certainly love to take some of your um, your questions now and uh, hopefully um, help you all understand a little bit more.
Thank you so much, Dr. Christensen. Uh, before we say goodbye, like uh, Dr. Christensen had said, we'd like to offer a little more time for any last-minute questions, so please type those in the chat box now. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to be typed in, just a couple of reminders. If you have requested continuing um, education credits for either nursing or pharmacy uh, for today's webinar, please make sure that you complete the survey which will either pop up on your screen when the webinar is ended or appear in the post-webinar email if you don't complete it right away. Uh, the email will be sent out by the end of today and all CEUs will be mailed out within the next week. If you'd like to view or share this webinar, the recording will be available on our website along with information for future webinars. Please visit immunizenevada.org forward slash webinars for those uh, details. It doesn't look like any questions have come in at this point. I would just want to make a comment to you, Dr. Christensen. I love that you really kind of brought it full circle for us in that you were able to um, you know, let us know that there was a lot to learn from in that first experience that you had down in Phoenix and that um, every chance like that, especially when you're starting in something new and innovative, is going to offer a lot of chance for um, education for everyone involved. So I think that's a big takeaway for us specifically in that you know, not to be afraid to, to take on these endeavors for fear of you know, not knowing all the variables, but just um, taking the time to learn along the way and to address um, you know, those opportunities for learning as they come up. So I was really inspired by that piece specifically. Um, and we have had um, a couple of comments and then a couple of questions that have come in in the meantime. Um, there was just a comment on the van saying that um, how cool it is. So <laughs> you did a great job. I great. think that that first, yeah, that first van really served as the model for the second, <laughs> which, um, which is great for that too. Um, the other question or question that came in uh, was for homeless youth whose parents are out of the picture but are still technically the child's legal, legal guardian, how do you navigate the issues of consent for medical care? Great question. And so um, there are, um, there are a set of laws that um, govern consent and medical care for uh, minors, um, unaccompanied minors, and minors even still in the, in the custody of, of uh, their parents. So for instance, um, if an adolescent wants to be tested for um, STI, sexually transmitted infections, they can. They don't necessarily need a parent's permission to be able to get that testing. Now remember that all people that are doing the testing are also obligate reporters. So if you're a 12-year-old and you've been um, abused and this sort of comes out, that person who would be testing you um, would have uh, an obligation to report to Child Protective Services, um, police departments, et cetera, et cetera. But let's say you're a 17 year old and um, you are having um, um, sex with another 17 year old and you wanted to be tested, you can actually uh, get that done. Now, depending on insurances and whether or not who's paying for that, those kind of things, those are different, um, different um, topics because insurance companies don't necessarily have to keep things confidential. Um, once you're allowed to consent for something, you're allowed, or at least the laws uh, are, are um, allowable for confidentiality. But those are two different topics, consent and confidentiality. And I do a lecture on, on both of those. It's a much bigger topic. But suffice it to say is that usually consent does lead to confidentiality. Now, if you're homeless um, in certain states, um, if you're homeless for even a length of time and you're a minor and there's good cause why you don't go and, and, and have your parents consent for you, your mom is abusing drugs and you don't know where your dad is, um, you can actually become emancipated. Um, so I think the state of Massachusetts has some emancipation laws. Um, and um, 
you poof become emancipated. Other states like Arizona made emancipation um, somewhat challenging where you had to go to a judge and ask for emancipation and you would have to tell the reason. Therefore, most of the teens that I saw in Arizona never became emancipated. However, the state of Arizona allowed them to, um, to consent to medical care um, so as long as it had um, it, it was within some constraints. So they could consent to primary care, they could consent to mental health care, uh, even though they were a minor. Um, and that brought with it the, the confidentiality as well. You couldn't consent for sterilization and you couldn't consent for inpatient psychiatric care in the state of Arizona. The state of Nevada actually has even um, what I would, I guess, describe as more progressive laws around emancipation. So there are a number of laws in the state of, Arizona, in the state of Nevada in which that same holds true. So teens that are out on the streets and could have just reason why they don't want to get their parents involved actually can consent for uh, medical care and can sign on their own behalf. Again, they can't consent for uh, sterilization. Nevada goes actually a little bit further in terms of consent for uh, pregnant teens um, and or uh, teen moms. They actually um, do become emancipated, um, so to speak, in the state of Nevada. Again, a tricky conversation, but um, um, uh, with lots more caveats than, than I'm able to, to give at this point, but they're able to consent um, is the bottom line. Perfect. And Chelsea had had a uh, follow-up question for um, just more, with regard to more routine care, such as immunizations, would that be included in, in that consent as well? Yeah, actually, and that was something that was a, a little bit uh, um, uh, unusual from the consent forms um, from Nevada to Arizona was a learning experience to me. So we had a lot more uh, rules and regulations on vaccine consents um, in Arizona. Um, again, we we had our legal team look at it, and clearly homeless minors could consent for um, health care, including vaccinations there. Um, Nevada is actually a little less, there was a, a little less uh, rules and regulations around vaccines, so they clearly can consent for vaccines as well. And I had a question just to, in with regard to determining homelessness, or I guess, I mean, and not to say that people are, or homeless youth are out there being, you know, purposely, um, the purposely misleading healthcare providers, but is there a way to ve like officially verify that that child? I mean, it, it it's kind of a fine line in my mind to try to verify that they are indeed homeless and not just seeking out medical care independent of their families that you know they very well may live with. So, is there a way to kind of determine whether or not? They truly are homeless. I mean, I assume the assumption can be made because they're accessing a mobile health clinic that they are, but um, is there any sort of um, process for, for that specifically? Sure. So it's a good question. So um, some of that is uh, verification, and that really um, tends to run along uh, from an insurance perspective. So uh, the mobile units in Arizona uh, and clearly the mobile units here are to deliver care to, uh, with, a, with a vision and mission of delivering care to those that are homeless or at high risk. So in Arizona, we didn't care. If they were living in a hotel and so they had a roof over their head, they still got the same services as those that were uh, homeless. Um, the... Um, the uh, medical care at Nevada Health Center is a federally qualified health clinic. So again, their mission is to take care of those that have insurance or do not have insurance. So neither of them precludes that. Now there is some there is uh, um, a uh, um, a process to review to see kind of where you fall. So if you're insured. 
um, you, you know, you have uh, uh, an insurance plan or a card or whatnot. And if not, they, and you qualify, they can help you get on that insurance plan. Um, but if you do not have any insurance, um, again, you qualify for a number of services um, because of Nevada Health Center being a federally qualified health clinic. And it's not really an, uh, uh, a difficult uh, verification process. Again, if you're living on the streets or something like that, um, Nevada Health Center um, does not um, kind of force you to go back to the shelter to get a letter that says, yes, you're living on the streets. They just consider that um, um, a self-verification and so make the process um, somewhat uh, easy. Um, does that uh, help uh, understand that? So in terms of applying for insurance, there might be more verification, pay stubs or something like that if you have a job um, and kind of address. Um, but other than that, um, the care is provided. And an FQHC cannot turn anybody away um, based upon uh, lack of payment. No, and that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think that the last thing that we need are additional barriers to you know, inhibit anyone from accessing medical care. So it's nice to hear that the process isn't super involved for them to access that, absolutely. Um, we had a, a comment from a participant as well, which um, I think is super pertinent um, as far as using people first language. Um, so saying, re referencing, um, you know, people and teens experiencing homelessness instead of homeless people uh, to focus on their experience and circumstance instead of making their circumstance their whole identity by saying homeless teens, homeless youth. So I think that that's a great comment to make. I know sometimes I can fall into that as well. So um, it's important to be, to be mindful of that too. Um, and we you had a... Yes. So we had a, um, a, another question come in. Have other clinics and health systems converted to the enhanced medical home model? And how, to get, um, how would you get buy-in from large healthcare systems? So right now the big sort of um, term that is being used um, around, um, around the country to look at a kind of a broader-based um, concept is sort of a team-based care. Um, hospitals are exploring this with, you know, a number of sort of subspecialties or uh, pharmacists and dietitians and such, but um, community projects, particularly those that um, are looking at innovative ways um, to, um, to connect to the community, um, indeed are starting to look at processes that add in, uh, you know, whether you're talking about uh, spiritual, behavioral, medical, kind of the whole big concept all put together. And I, I think it's, it's interesting to see how those are playing out in different areas. Um, you know, there, there are communities that are, you know, close-knit and tied, some of the communities in, in Alaska, for example, or maybe uh, tribal communities, uh, again, um, seeking to get other information um, and other people at the table, not just sort of the typical medical providers. Perfect. And Kia, I hope that answered that question for you too. And I just want to um, say as, as we wrap up here, I don't, I don't see any other questions. Um, that it have showed up in the chat box here. But if there is by chance anything that we weren't able to address thoroughly on this call or any questions that you come up with um, after the call has ended, please feel free to um, email me directly at brianne at immunizednevada.org or info at immunizednevada.org and we'll be careful to um, either answer those ourselves as Immunize Nevada or forward those questions on to Dr. Christensen if it's outside of, of our realm of expertise. Um, so with that, um, we will go ahead and wrap up today's presentation. Again, thank you so much to Dr. Christensen and to those of you who have participated today. Um, we really appreciate the engagement, especially at the end with those questions. And um, we hope that you guys all have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.
This conference will now be disconnected. Goodbye.